Welcome everyone to the Atrial Fibrillation Virtual Education Summit presented by the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine at CardioCare Live. My name is Dr. Michael Blaha and you are tuned in to a live session called Patient Selection, the Key to Optimizing Therapy with Atrial Fibrillation Ablation Therapy with Dr. Joseph Marine. Dr. Marine is an Associate Professor of Medicine at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. Dr. Marine is also the Associate Division Chief of Cardiology, National Capital Region Section Chief for Cardiology at the Johns Hopkins Community Physicians and Associate Director of Electrophysiology. Before we get started, I would like to remind our audience that we will be taking questions in real time throughout this presentation. You can send me your questions anytime throughout the program through the box on the lower left hand side of your screen. So without further ado, let's go to Dr. Marine and start the talk. Thank you, Michael. Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be back on the program. Um, I look forward to talking to you today about patient selection, the key to optimizing outcomes with AF ablation therapy. I have no competing interests relative to this presentation, uh, but during this presentation, we will briefly discuss the use of amiodarone for treatment of atrial fibrillation, which is not FDA approved. Uh, and our objectives today will be to understand the role of catheter ablation therapy for treatment of AF, to select among alternatives to ablation therapy for AF, and to properly select patients for referral for catheter ablation of AF. We'll start with an interesting case. DS presented one and a half years ago as a 59-year-old woman with recurrent severe palpitations. During her emergency department evaluation, she was diagnosed with atrial fibrillation, and you can see her electrocardiogram below. She continued to have episodes of palpitations three to four days per week, which were fairly severe, eight out of 10 severity. Her past history was notable for hypertension, a knee replacement, and pulmonary embolism. Her echocardiogram showed normal LV function with mild left atrial enlargement. She was started on warfarin, metoprolol, and dronetarone therapy. Dronetarone reduced her symptoms but was caused a significant GI upset, and so she was switched to flecainide therapy with no improvement. And so she is re referred for EP study and catheter ablation. The next few slides show some scenes of her uh, ablation. This is a uh, venogram of a right inferior pulmonary vein taken during the procedure. Here we have a catheter and venogram in the left inferior pulmonary vein. And this shows some of the mapping technology that we use that I'll explain in further detail later in the program. But she underwent complete pulmonary vein isolation of all of her pulmonary veins. In follow-up, she had occasional palpitations for one or two months, which gradually subsided by three months. And at one year follow-up, she had no palpitations and underwent two rounds of 30-day event monitoring that showed only sinus rhythm. And uh, sinus rhythm ECG is shown below in the panel. Atrial fibrillation is a disease of enormous clinical significance. It's the most common sustained arrhythmia. It's an important cause of stroke with approximately 20% attributable risk in older patients. There's significant morbidity for symptoms, uh, with symptoms in many patients, including palpitations, malaise, loss of exercise tolerance, and reduced quality of life. In a minority of patients, a tachymyopathy or excessively rapid heart rate may produce congestive heart failure. And as Dr. Calkins reviewed, uh, atrial fibrillation has been consistently associated with increased mortality in a number of different epidemiologic studies. This data from the Atria study, uh, a population study of approximately 2 million Kaiser Permanente patients in California, shows the marked increase in age uh, that is associated with atrial fibrillation, reaching approximately 10% prevalence in patients over the age of 80 years. The prevalence in the U.S. has been estimated at a minimum of 2.5 million patients and as high as 5 million patients currently, and this number is expected to double uh, by 2040. So um, there's going to be a great deal of atrial fibrillation uh, for us to address. This slide shows uh, a, a, a section from the uh, AHA ACC 2006 guideline for the management of patients with atrial fibrillation. And as Dr. Calkins mentioned, this guideline is due to be updated in the fall. The main goals outlined by this document are uh, to reduce the risk of thromboembolism, to preserve ventricular function, to minimize symptoms, and to maximize patients' quality of life. So we had one question come in. I want to maybe sure. field the question while we look at those slides. Um, 
someone went ahead and asked, uh, I think they're starting to think about symptoms because you mentioned symptoms. Um, I guess we'll talk a little bit uh, about the patient, of course, with symptomatic AF. But they mm -hmm. also asked a question about what about the patient without symptoms? Let's say primary care doctor detects AF routinely on an EKG that they do in the office and they, you know, they find AFib and the patient yes. may not be aware of it. It certainly is not going to be in the uh, ablation algorithm just yet, but how would you kind of think about that patient and when would they, mm -hmm. I guess, proceed into kind of fitting into this talk? Well, the main goals of all patients with atrial fibrillation, whether they're symptomatic or not, are to have adequate rate control uh, so that one does not develop a tachymyopathy. And the second important goal is appropriate anticoagulation right. for those patients who are at risk. So I would say those are the top two concerns for the asymptomatic patients. Right. Now, we don't have strong evidence that asymptomatic patients benefit from any other therapy, but right. we'll talk further um, in the uh, program about, uh, about those patients in particular. Okay, yeah, that's a great, good question. We're still not able to advance the slides. So we'll, we'll uh, work out this issue. issue. Um, so maybe another question real quick. Uh, you know, we, Hugh and I talked about this in the last session. You know, uh, atrial fibrillation is becoming so much more common. Certainly with, you know, maybe coronary disease is decreasing in, in incidence, but obesity and diabetes are going up. And obesity and diabetes, particularly obesity, particularly sleep apnea and things, are associated with more AFib. Mm. Uh, we're going to see an epidemic of AFib, aren't we? That's certainly what is projected. Mm. Um, we're seeing certainly rising incidents over uh, the past decades that have been looked at in epidemiologic mm -hmm. studies, and I think that uh, all of the demographic trends suggest that we're going to see more and more atrial fibrillation in the coming years. We already have a very high uh, burden in the general population, right. so we're all you know, seeing lots of atrial fibrillation um, in our clinics oh, and in our hospitals. In our hospitals, yeah, particularly. You know. I feel like we see that all the time in the hospitals. So it's certainly something that, from a public health standpoint, warrants addressing at multiple levels uh, prevention as much as therapy for the patients who actually right, yeah, do present with important. AFib. And, of course, this you know, ablation will become increasingly more of a concern as we have you know, more and more people living into advanced ages with atrial fibrillation that's probably symptomatic in a lot of cases. Okay, let's go back to our slides. Right. So uh, one of the first important issues to address in any patient with atrial fibrillation, whether they are symptomatic or not, is the risk of thromboembolism. Uh, a panel from a transesophageal echocardiogram is shown in the upper right, which shows a thrombus sitting in the left atrial appendage. And LA thrombi, uh, about 90% occur in the left atrial appendage of those that are going to occur. The factors that are uh, relevant towards forming these thrombi include stasis, endothelial dysfunction, and hypercoagulability. And of course, when a thrombus embolizes to the brain, uh, one can get a stroke, as shown in the lower right panel. But emboli can also go to the intestine, to the leg, or to a coronary artery. The overall risk uh, in unselected AF patients of thromboembolism is about 2 to 5% per year. And if we could advance the next slide. Dr. Hawkins talked about the CHADS and CHADS VAS score. The CHADS score, I think most people are uh, familiar with. The CHADS VAS score is used increasingly in Europe and in Canada and is likely to be increasingly adopted uh, in the United States. General recommendations for anticoagulation with patients uh, with AF are is that if one has a CHADS or CHADS VAS score of zero or lone atrial fibrillation, either aspirin or no therapy is recommended. For those patients with a score of two or more, Oral anticoagulation therapy with warfarin or one of the new uh, oral anticoagulants is recommended. And for those with an intermediate score of one, either aspirin or oral anticoagulation can be considered. Among the other factors which may influence decision making uh, are that we usually anticoagulate patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, amyloidosis, thyrotoxicosis, and rheumatic mitral stenosis regardless uh, of their CHADS or chads vas score because of the elevated risk of thromboembolism that's associated with these diseases. And as Dr. Hawkins reviewed, we now have four oral anticoagulants to choose from in the United States, including warfarin, dabigatran, rivaroxaban, and apixaban. This slide shows uh, how the uh, ACC AHA recommends classification of atrial fibrillation. We speak of atrial fibrillation that is first detected. We speak of atrial fibrillation that is paroxysmal when it is self-terminating uh, within seven days. We speak of AFib that is persistent when it is not self-terminating or it requires urgent cardioversion. 
Um, in red, you see permanent atrial fibrillation, which is des uh, defined as atrial fibrillation where cardioversion is ineffective or not attempted. And essentially, it's a joint decision between the patient and doctor to uh, maintain permanent atrial fibrillation. In the lower right, you see an additional category of long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation, which is referred to in the AF ablation literature. And this refers to persistent atrial fibrillation that is sustained continuously for one year or longer. This slide uh, shows some of the um, dominant uh, theories of mechanism of atrial fibrillation. The multiple wavelet hypothesis was proposed uh, a little over 50 years ago now. And that uh, hypothesis or uh, theory proposes that to maintain atrial fibrillation requires maintenance of four to six circulating wavelets. You can see in the upper left panel uh, multiple wavelets that are sort of forming and constantly reforming and colliding along no fixed pathway. And so there, therefore produces a totally chaotic state of atrial activation shown in the ECG below. Another important concept that's developed over the past 15 years is the importance of triggers of atrial fibrillation. And that's shown nicely in this Holter monitor, which in the top panel shows initial sinus bradycardia. And you can see towards the right uh, with the arrows a flurry of atrial premature contractions that then sustains as a rapid atrial tachycardia and then degenerates into atrial fibrillation. And so our current concept of uh, atrial fibrillation mechanism includes an important role for uh, atrial substrate, atrial enlargement and fibrosis shown in the upper right panel. Vagal innervation also has an important role by lowering the atrial refractory period. And these uh, factors combine to allow these multiple wavelets to sustain atrial fibrillation. Uh, also very important is the role of triggers. Uh, paroxysmal SVT may be a trigger of atrial fibrillation in a few percent of patients, as may be atrial flutter. But as we'll talk about, the predominant trigger in AF is uh, atrial premature beats and focal atrial tachycardia coming from the pulmonary veins and other thoracic veins. As the panel on the lower right shows, these trigger and substrate factors interact in sort of a vicious circle that we'll talk about more in the program of how these factors interact and uh, cause atrial fibrillation to become more sustained and persistent over time. Another important concept is the uh, a concept of progression of atrial fibrillation. Towards the left, paroxysmal fib uh, atrial fibrillation is believed to be predominantly a trigger issue. That is, atrial premature beats or atrial tachycardia coming from the pulmonary veins in most cases with PSVT and atrial flutter uh, being uh, triggering factors in a minority of cases. As atrial fibrillation progresses through the persistent phase and then goes into long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation, substrate, substrate factors become much more predominant. And that includes electrical remodeling, neurohormonal changes, atrial fibrosis, and atrial enlargement. So we'll next turn to the subject of rate versus rhythm control. Advocates for rate control point out that many AF patients are minimally symptomatic, that rate control strategy avoids antiarrhythmic drug toxicities and is simpler and less costly. Proponents of the rhythm control strategy note that there are uh, strong hemodynamic benefits to normal sinus rhythm, including left atrial contribution to ventricular filling and the benefits of a regular rhythm. Rhythm control also potentially avoids the risk of tachymyopathy in AF with poorly controlled rate and there's at least some theoretical reasons why rhythm control might reduce the risk of stroke and mortality. This uh, concept or debate was put to the test in the AFFIRM trial, which is now a little over 10 years old. This study uh, took 4,000 patients with atrial fibrillation and at least one stroke risk factor. The patients had a mean age of 70 years. And they were randomized to a strategy of either rhythm control, generally with antiarrhythmic drugs, or rate control. And uh, as you can see from the, cap, from the uh, survival analysis shown um, in the center of the panel, the cumulative mortality of the two arms was approximately the same. There was no benefit to rhythm control in overall mortality as compared with rate control. In addition, the stroke rate, surprisingly, was slightly higher in the rhythm control arm than it was in the rate control arm. So there was no significant difference there either. Some important caveats of the AFFIRM trial. 
is that this included mainly older patients. They were by definition able to tolerate a rate control strategy. And also the follow-up period, which was relatively long at three and a half to four years, uh, still does not encompass the entire potential lifespan of the younger patient with atrial fibrillation who might look at being in atrial fibrillation for 15 or 20 years. This slide shows a post hoc analysis which uh, also raises some several important points. This was an analysis that looked at uh, outcome based on uh, covariates and those included maintenance of sinus rhythm. So you can see that patients who maintain sinus rhythm regardless of strategy did better than those who did not. Patients who were on warfarin therapy uh, did better regardless of strategy and I think this illustrates the very important point and one of the important lessons of the trial is that we generally should anticoagulate patients uh, based on their stroke risk factors regardless of what rhythm they're in when they show up in our offices. Conversely, digoxin use and antiarrhythmic drug use was associated with uh, increased uh, mortality and poor outcome. And this illustrates for many of us that the benefits of sinus rhythm are offset by the toxicity of antiarrhythmic drugs used in the AFFIRM trial. So if one does choose a medical rate control, better beta blockers are generally the first line therapy with diltiazem and rapamil being important alternatives. Digoxin is generally a second line therapy used in patients with heart failure and LV dysfunction or as a second agent if the first agent is not completely successful. The target of therapy for rate control is to minimize symptoms, avoid tachymyopathy, and generally try to control resting rate at about 70 to 90 beats per minute. Now one uh, a therapy that's potentially available if uh, medical rate control is not sufficient is the ablate and pace strategy. This strategy involves implanting a permanent pacemaker. The type of pacemaker would depend on whether the patient has permanent AF, paroxysmal AF, or if heart failure is present. Once the pacemaker is implanted, the AV node can be very simply ablated in about a 10 minute procedure with a single catheter producing complete AV block and pacemaker dependence. This is an excellent option, particularly in older patients in whom refractory re uh, rapid ventricular response is the main problem. And a number of studies have shown that this strategy reduces symptoms and improves quality of life in properly selected patients. For patients in whom a uh, rhythm control strategy is um, advised or recommended. Uh, we have from the ACC AHA guidelines in 2006, updated in 2011, shows a general algorithm for how to approach antiarrhythmic drug therapy for maintenance of sinus rhythm. And you can see that this guideline categorizes patients into four different categories. Those who have no or minimal structural heart disease, those who have hypertension, those who have coronary disease, and those who have heart failure. For patients who have minimal or no structural heart disease, we have a wide uh, range of choices, including dronetarone, flecainide, propafenone, and sotalol, uh, uh, amiodarone, dofetilide, or second line. And you can see throughout this uh, algorithm that catheter ablation is generally reserved as second line therapy for those who do not maintain sinus rhythm and continue to have symptoms despite treatment with at least one antiarrhythmic drug. This slide shows some of the randomized controlled trials, comparative effectiveness trials of different antiarrhythmic drugs. And you can see the takeaway uh, message from this is that amiodarone controls atrial fibrillation at two years in about 50 to 60% of patients, whereas all the other antiarrhythmic drugs, uh, sotalol, propafenone, flecainide, are about half as effective with approximately 25 to 30% maintenance of sinus rhythm uh, at uh, two years. We also have to bear in mind, in addition to the limited efficacy of antiarrhythmic drugs, that these do have adverse effects, particularly proarrhythmia and uh, extracardiac side effects. Uh, flecainide and propafenone were associated with increased mortality in the CAS trial, and so these drugs generally cannot be used in patients with coronary disease or really any form of significant structural heart disease. Sotalol and dofetilide is associated with torsade de Pointe ventricular tachycardia in 1 to 3 percent of patients, and amiodarone has a number of extracardiac side effects, most concerning of which is the risk for pulmonary toxicity. So uh, perhaps we could pause here and see if there's any questions about medical therapy of atrial fibrillation before we launch into catheter ablation. Yes. 
We would love to have some questions from the audience, particularly about side effects. I think that's usually a common question. But sure. One, I'll share one question that we had in the last session, which I think is a good question because it comes up and I hear this question sometimes. So flecainide really isn't recommended with coronary disease, of course. What about the a patient that I guess the clinician feels is fully revascularized and completely stable? Would you be feel, feel comfortable using flecainide in that patient, or do you say no? Generally not, because of the unpredictable risk of recurrent ischemic events, right. which may occur when the patient is on uh, flecainide. So as a general rule, and I think it is a black box warning in the, drug, in, in the label that patients who have had a prior myocardial infarction of any type should not receive flecainide regardless of the state of revascularization. I think that's yeah. a, a good general rule is to reserve the type 1 agents to those who have a structurally normal heart. Yeah, that's a great point. So if we have any questions, no more questions coming in, right. in real quick. So, we'll so let's on. continue. Sure, well, and we'll move on now to ablation therapy. And this field really all started with the uh, surgeons, cardiac surgeons, particularly James Cox, who at the uh, University of Washington in St. Louis developed the surgical maze operation shown in the panel on the left. The concept here was to divide the right atrium and left atrium into segments that are too small to support AF wavelets, again, building on this predominant concept of the AF wavelet hypothesis of Moe and Alessi. Uh, this operation had extensive preclinical testing uh, in animals, and the first patient received this operation in 1987. Uh, the operation is quite successful. Long-term studies show approximately 75 to 95 percent long-term maintenance of sinus rhythm with the full maze operation. However, it is a complex procedure. It requires cardiopulmonary bypass. It's associated with sinus node dysfunction in 10 to 15 percent of patients, and in loss of left atrial transport in approximately 10 percent of patients. And so while the full maze operation is not performed very much, it still stands as the gold standard of what we're all trying to achieve with uh, AF ablation therapies. Now, cardiologists and electrophysiologists tried to reproduce the, the catheter maze operation with a catheter, uh, the first report coming out in about 1994. Uh, but to summarize, multiple, multiple groups tried this, but the uh, success rate was poor, and the complication rate was quite high. The next major advance in catheter ablation therapy of AF uh, was reported by Hassiger and colleagues in Bordeaux, France. They studied a very select group of patients with atrial fibrillation, 45 patients with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, who had AF at least every other day. They also had Holter monitors showing at least 700 atrial premature beats in a 24-hour period. And they had a relatively normal left atrial size and normal structural hearts. These were predominantly lone paroxysmal atrial fibrillation patients. And what they did is they brought them to the EP lab performed electrophysiology study, and very uh, uh, painstakingly uh, mapped where the atrial premature beats were coming from that seemed to be initiating atrial fibrillation. And as you can see in the upper left, they found that most AF in these patients was originating from the pulmonary veins. These slides show electrical activity emanating from the pulmonary veins, then leading or degenerating into paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. In the panel on the lower left, they mapped where the predominant focus of trigger of atrial fibrillation was in the 45 patients. And you can see from that diagram that 95% of the triggers did come from one or more pulmonary veins. Now, one can ask what is special about the pulmonary veins and the pulmonary venous anatomy that leads to atrial fibrillation? And I think the short answer is that we don't fully understand this. We do understand that there are sleeves of atrial myocardium that invest the pulmonary veins as well as other thoracic veins, and there seems to be something about the border zone of myocardium and vein that may be arrhythmogenic in these patients. In addition, uh, the pulmonary vein ostia are the sites of vagal innervation shown in the panel on right. The yellow shows the fat pads of vagal innervation and the interaction between this area of myocardial venous interface with the autonomic innervation uh, may be one explanation for why these are hot spots or triggers of AF, uh, of AF in paroxysmal patients. So to summarize a great deal of uh, literature, the current approach that we take uh, to AF ablation uh, involves a patient first gets a CT or MRI of their left atrium to import into our mapping system. The patient is brought to the EP laboratory and generally placed under general anesthesia. A double transeptal technique is performed, getting two sheaths 
into the left atrium, and then wide area circumferential ablation in a point-by-point -point fashion is performed, uh, staying in the pulmonary venous antra and outside of the pulmonary veins until all four pulmonary veins are completely encircled with ablation lesions. Uh, the cartoon on the left shows a circular mapping catheter. We place that electrical mapping catheter in each of the pulmonary veins and continue ablating until we can show that electrical activity is completely abolished in all four of the pulmonary veins. And that's shown in the two panels on the right. Uh, the left panel shows uh, electrical activity in the pulmonary vein, and then the right panel shows the same vein with the electrical activity absent after electrical isolation is performed. We then wait for 30 minutes to make sure the electrical activity uh, stays silent, um, and then the procedure is concluded. In a, uh, some patients, additional ablation is performed in selected patients, uh, particularly those with more structural uh, disease in their atrium and more long-standing atrial fibrillation may get additional ablation of fractionated electrograms uh, in addition to lines are sometimes placed in those with atrial flutter. But the predominant approach and the main goal is to isolate the pulmonary veins electrically. This is a uh, slide showing sort of in real time what we can see with the mapping system. You can see the catheter moving in a point-by-point -point basis, uh, making ablation lesions on the ridge that lies between the left-sided pulmonary veins uh, and the left atrial appendage. And you can see the great accuracy and detail uh, that our current mapping technology allows us to place these lesions properly. An additional new technology available uh, in the United States is the cryoballoon. Uh, this is a, a, a somewhat different approach to uh, uh, isolation of the pulmonary veins and involves a um, placement of a large balloon catheter in the ostium of each pulmonary vein and then freezing circumferentially around the pulmonary vein ostia to achieve isolation. So it's sort of a new tool, uh, but the goal is really the same as for catheter ablation. And trials so far have shown similar single procedure efficacy for the cryo balloon as for um, RF energy. There have been a number of studies now comparing catheter ablation therapy with antiarrhythmic drug therapy uh, for atrial fibrillation management. Here is one uh, a major study performed by Dr. Calkins and colleagues who did a meta-analysis of studies published up to 2009 uh, and he looked at 63 eligible studies of patients who underwent AF ablation, including 8,789 patients. Nine uh, studies were randomized controlled trials, 49 were prospective, and 12 were retrospective studies. The antiarrhythmic drug study arm included 34 eligible studies, uh, encompassing 6,500 patients, 24 of which were randomized controlled trials. And the active treatment arm in these drug studies included amiodarone, propafenone, sodalol, dofetilide, and flecainide. Here is a summary of the results of this meta-analysis. On the antiarrhythmic drug study arm, about 52% of patients maintained sinus rhythm over the study period. On the right side shows the RF catheter ablation results. Single procedure success without any use of antiarrhythmic drugs resulted in 57% success rate. But you can see in the panel as it goes to the right that increasing success is offered if patients undergo multiple procedures and if uh, previously ineffective antiarrhythmic drugs are used. So 70% of patients who undergo more than one study who have antiarrhythmic drugs that were previously ineffective continued uh, maintain sinus rhythm. Uh, the final bar in right notes that about 26% of patients in trials required a second procedure uh, to achieve success. Now, it's important to remember in this meta-analysis uh, that most patients in the antiarrhythmic drug trials were receiving drug therapy for the first time, whereas most patients getting catheter ablation had already failed in antiarrhythmic drugs. So in this meta-analysis, the deck was kind of stacked against uh, ablation therapy. When we look at randomized trials of catheter ablation of AF versus antiarrhythmic drug therapy, we see even stronger uh, effect in favor of, uh, of uh, ablation therapy. This is a meta-analysis studying four different randomized controlled trials of AF ablation therapy versus antiarrhythmic drug therapy. And you can see in the summary that approximately AF ablation was associated with approximately three-fold higher success. 76% of the ablation therapy patients maintained sinus rhythm, whereas only 19% of the antiarrhythmic drug therapy patients maintained sinus rhythm.
So most of these trials were patients who had failed a previous antiarrhythmic drug uh, therapy trial, which explains why I think there's a greater uh, disparity in favor of, uh, of ablation therapy in this trial. The next panel shows the Thermocool randomized trial, which was one of the largest randomized trials yet published of AF ablation therapy versus antiarrhythmic drug therapy. This trial looked at 167 patients with symptomatic paroxysmal atrial fibrillation despite treatment with at least one antiarrhythmic drug and randomized them either to another antiarrhythmic drug or therapy with uh, catheter ablation therapy with open irrigated RF catheter. And you can see from the survival analysis that whether one is looking at symptom, uh, freedom from symptomatic AF or, symptomatic, or freedom from any uh, atrial tachyarrhythmia, about 70, per, 70 to 75 percent of patients in the ablation arm maintain freedom from arrhythmia, whereas only about 15 to 20 percent of antiarrhythmic drug-treated patients did so. In addition, quality of life was improved uh, in the ablation arm. It's important to point out that there are risks associated with catheter ablation therapy for AF. These include pulmonary vein stenosis, seen in approximately 1% of patients. This was a much bigger uh, problem early on in ablation experience, and we've learned over time that when one stays as far away as possible uh, from the ostium of the pulmonary vein, the, the risk of this complication is reduced. Uh, stroke is a risk in approximately 1% of patients. Uh, these are split fairly evenly between TIAs and uh, cerebrovascular accidents with a total of approximately 1%. Pericardial tamponade is still seen in approximately 1% of cases, and this is due to the, uh, the nature of the procedure requiring transeptal approach and multiple catheters in the left atrium with uh, use of high-dose anticoagulants during the procedure. The right phrenic nerve can be injured in about 1 out of 500 cases. This is usually the right phrenic nerve, which can pass close to the right superior pulmonary vein. Left atrial esophageal fistula is the most feared complication of AF ablation therapy. It's been reported for both surgical as well as catheter ablation therapy with an incidence of approximately 1 in 1,000 patients. It has a high mortality rate and typically presents around 2 to 6 weeks after the procedure with fever, odynophagia, delirium, or stroke. And so the total complication rate reported from the procedure is approximately 3 to 5 percent. This slide shows the rate of complications uh, reported in the worldwide survey uh, of atrial fibrillation updated uh, in, a, in about 2010, and it shows an approximately 4.5% 4, 4 overall major complication rate of the procedure. My colleague David Sprague and Hannah Hoyt uh, looked at our experience at Johns Hopkins uh, over time with complication rates from catheter ablation, and you can see on the right panel shows uh, the year and uh, as year and year went on, we did more and more of these procedures, uh, up to about 200 uh, procedures per year, with increasing number of operators performing these procedures. And uh, with that increasing experience, you can see in the panel on the left that the complication rate has fallen uh, from initially around 8 to 10 percent down to approximately 2 percent in the last year uh, that was studied. Dr. Sprague found that older age, higher CHAD score, and female gender were predictive of higher complication rate. The next couple panels uh, sort of summarizes a general approach to AF management in 2013. When a patient presents with atrial fibrillation, we perform our uh, diagnostic workup. We consider uh, indication for anticoagulation therapy. We rate control patients, and then we consider cardioverting them. If patients recur after their cardioversion and they have minimal symptoms or no symptoms from AF, that is an appropriate patient to consider for long-term rate control and anticoagulation without further aggressive therapy. For the patient who continues to have symptoms after recurrence of AF, we uh, start an antiarrhythmic drug and then repeat a cardioversion if the patient has persistent atrial fibrillation. If the patient then recurs after this uh, trial of antiarrhythmic drug therapy, if they are a poor risk for AF ablation, then we consider a second antiarrhythmic drug or an ablate and pace approach to their, uh, to their atrial fibrillation. For patients who are good risks uh, for atrial fibrillation ablation, we consider catheter ablation. We would consider surgical ablation if they met, met criteria or needed to undergo 
cardiac surgery. So for example, a patient who had severe mitral valve disease or severe coronary disease needed cardiac surgery, that's a patient that we would refer to get a concomitant AF ablation procedure during their cardiac surgery. But for most patients, catheter ablation is what would be considered. Now how do we consider this uh, approach to patient selection and, uh, and risk? Uh, I borrowed this slide from Dr. Calkins, who very nicely outlines our thinking in how we approach this. And it's really considering patients along a spectrum from the more optimal patient to the less optimal patient. So in general, for catheter ablation of AF, we like to see patients who are more symptomatic than patients who are minimally symptomatic, since the main goal of catheter ablation is to reduce symptoms. We generally like to see patients who have had a trial of at least one antiarrhythmic drug, and our current guidelines do still suggest this. In general, patients with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation have a higher a success rate from the procedure than those with more long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation. We'll discuss this more later in the program. In general, patients, with, uh, patients who are younger uh, do better and have lower complication rates with the procedure than patients who are older. Patients who have less structural remodeling of their left atrium, those who have smaller left atria tend to do better than those with larger left atrium. Similarly, those who have normal ejection fraction, less structural heart disease, tend to do better, better outcome, lower complication rate than those who have more structural heart disease. Uh, patients with concomitant diseases such as pulmonary disease, sleep apnea, and obesity uh, tend to do better than those who do not have these comorbidities. And then finally, those who have had a prior stroke or TIA uh, uh, have a lower complication rate, as we'll talk about later in the program, uh, than those who have had a prior stroke. So I'll mention now the uh, Cabana trial. This is a uh, multi-center randomized controlled trial uh, which aims to randomize 3,000 atrial fibrillation ablation uh, patients uh, who are candidates for either catheter ablation therapy or medical therapy. This is an NIH-sponsored trial that's being run out of the Mayo Clinic in Duke. Um, and its goal, again, is to randomize 3,000 patients. Over a three to five year period is the enrollment period. Patients will undergo at least two years of minimal follow-up. The trial began in 2010 and aims to complete uh, uh, the trial by 2017. The primary endpoint for this trial, much like the AFFIRM trial, is total mortality. So it aims to see whether uh, catheter ablation therapy improves total mortality. There will, in addition, be a number of important secondary outcomes, including cardiac death, stroke, and heart failure. So this trial really aims to be the AFFIRM trial, if you will, uh, comparing um, rhythm control with catheter ablation therapy with all forms of medical therapy uh, for atrial fibrillation. And I think this is a very important trial to keep in mind, particularly for patients in whom the clinician is at equipoise, where you don't uh, feel the patient has a clear-cut indication for ablation therapy yet, uh, but yet you feel it might be an appropriate therapy for the patient. Now, this is an international trial with many sites, 128 active sites currently on four continents. There are quite a number of sites throughout the United States, um, and currently approximately uh, uh, 1,200 patients have already been enrolled. And again, this is just the trial design. It's a randomized trial of patients with atrial fibrillation. They can be at first presentation with no prior treatment with antiarrhythmic drug therapy. They have to have at least one stroke risk factor or age over 65. And they will be randomized then either to drug therapy or to catheter ablation therapy in a one-to-one -one fashion. So at this point, perhaps we can uh, stop and see if there are any questions. I have several cases now to pose uh, to the audience will allow us to discuss this issue of case selection in a little mm -hmm. more detail. I think the cases are going to be great. I think they're going to probably encapsulate a lot of the questions that people have. One, one question that I thought I'd reiterate, uh, someone presented a case. If I, that person would allow me to summarize that case. But briefly, uh, there was a, a situation where someone had a 79-year-old female with coronary disease who developed some atrial fibrillation, um, asymptomatic at a routine visit. Uh, I guess uh, because of some unfortunate circumstances, there was a, a sudden death. Hmm. Uh, I'll summarize by saying, is atrial fibrillation associated with sudden death at all in people with coronary disease or heart failure? AF is epidemiologically associated with a higher risk of total mortality. And I think in the, in the uh, recent study that Dr. Calkins went over in the last program with sudden death as well. Now, whether that is atrial fibrillation leading to ischemia and sudden death, right. 
or whether it's simply um, sort of fellow travelers that atrial fibrillation mm -hmm. is a marker for patients with more severe structural heart disease, more severe coronary disease, is difficult um, to say. Right. And medications probably would play in, too, if there was uh, antirhythmic drugs being used. This case, I guess, did involve use of amiodarone, mm -hmm. although um, certainly not implicated in sudden death, but uh, there could have been other situations, I guess, that could explain this, yes. uh, separate yes. from the AFib. Definitely. In, in general, uh, 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 antirhythmic drugs are generally more prorhythmic in patients with coronary mm -hmm. disease. There are a number of large randomized trials of amiodarone in patients with significant structural heart disease that have not shown an increased right. mortality rate with amiodarone. Um, so, um, again, I think in any one dif individual case, it's difficult to, right. to, to say. Right. All right, so let's go to the cases. All right. So uh, our first case is a 81-year-old man who presented with atrial fibrillation nine years ago. He underwent cardioversion but almost immediately went back into atrial fibrillation. He had immediate recurrence of AF and has been maintained in atrial fibrillation over those nine years since then. He complained of a mild sense of palpitations with exertion and some mild increase in fatigue and dyspnea on exertion over the past three to four years. His past history included coronary disease. He underwent stent implantation. He also had a history of hypertension and diabetes. His medications included metoprolol, warfarin, aspirin, clopidogrel, torvastatin, niacin, and irbisartan. His echocardiogram showed normal LV function, but a markedly enlarged left atrium with a diameter of 6.2 centimeters. So we'll now pose to the audience, what is the next therapy that you would choose? A, add flecainide, 100 milligrams twice daily, and cardiovert. B, add low-dose digoxin and manage in permanent AF. C, refer for surgical maze operation. D, refer for catheter ablation of AF. I'll give a few, few moments for the audience to answer. Let's go ahead and answer that question at home. Right, so here come the poll results. They're coming in in real time. Looks like right now, majority of people are saying they'd add low-dose digoxin and manage in permanent AF. Some people want to refer for catheter uh, ablation of AFib, actually about 50% now. Uh, the minority of patients, of course, are saying add flecainide. Mm -hmm. So I, I, would, I would agree uh, with answer B. I don't think there's an absolute uh, right answer to this question. Uh, in terms of answer A, I think a flecainide would be contraindicated in this patient, even though the ejection fraction is normal. In general, with any, any history of coronary disease, uh, we would not use uh, type 1 antirhythmic drug therapy. Um, in terms of answer C, surgical maze operation, this is a patient who has not been tried on antirhythmic drug therapy. Um, is really mildly symptomatic. I think it's a little premature to consider a surgical maze operation. I think that D uh, could be considered, and in fact the patient was referred for consideration of catheter ablation, uh, but we had a very frank talk about the, um, the significant amount of structural remodeling that this right. atrium had already undergone, the fact that he was already up to a six centimeter uh, in size, and the fact that he'd been continuously in AF for nine years. Uh, made the results uh, of the procedure not attractive to the patient, and he ultimately chose uh, answer B, which is low-dose digoxin and management and permanent in okay. AF. In the next okay. few slides, I'll kind of go over uh, the reasons uh, why we chose this therapy. This is a study uh, performed in dogs, which uh, looked at cellular changes that occur with AF chronicity. So as uh, animals were in AF for increasing periods of time, uh, the investigators were show, uh, showed increase in mitochondrial size and number, disruption of sarcoprasmic reticulum in the heart, myocyte hypertrophy, and abnormal sarcomere architecture. This was an interesting and important study uh, performed in patients undergoing cardiac surgery who had portions of their atrial appendage excised and then examined um, under microscopy. 104 patients had sinus rhythm and 42 patients had atrial fibrillation. In the panel on left uh, is a hist uh, histology of a patient who was in sinus rhythm, showing only 5% fibrosis in that atrium. The patient in the middle who had paroxysmal AF had approximately 14% fibrosis. And the patient on the right who had chronic atrial fibrillation had 35% fibrosis. So the message from this study is that the longer one is in continuous atrial fibrillation, the more fibrosis occurs in the atrium. Uh, similarly, from the same study shows that with increasing degree of uh, atrial fibrillation, as one goes from right to left, there's increasingly amounts of collagen and increasing left atrial size. Uh, 
This has been seen in the cath lab as well in our, in our, in the, our EP studies when we find patients who have large amounts of macroscopic fibrosis on their study, the, uh, the outcome of the procedure is clearly less effective than in those who do not have a great deal of scar burden. And this is seen whether we see scar on, left, on electroanatomic mopping or if we see scar by MRI, which is increasingly utilized uh, prior to AF ablation. And this again gets back to the concept that atrial fibrillation begets AF. That is, one goes through the progression of the disease from paroxysmal to long-standing persistent AF, substrate changes occur in the atrium that make the atrium less amenable to right. maintenance of sinus rhythm. So I think the central message is, if one is going to intervene to try to maintain sinus rhythm, it's better to do it earlier in the course of disease than later right. in the course of mm -hmm. disease. So we'll move on to Let's the... Do one uh, more case. Great. So case, uh, the next case is a 68-year-old woman with a six-month history of recurrent paroxysmal AF who was moderately symptomatic. She presented with a stroke with left hemiplegia. Her past medical history included type 1 diabetes and moderate chronic kidney disease. Her medications included apixaban, insulin, enalapril, and metoprolol. So the question is, what is the next therapy that you would choose for this patient? A, refer for catheter ablation of AF to reduce the risk for future stroke. B, add amiodarone to reduce the risk of stroke. C, add amiodarone to control AF symptoms. Or D, refer for surgical maze procedure and left atrial appendage ligation. We'll give a moment for the audience to answer. Yeah, let's have everyone put in their answers. So let's see, well, so far, we had 100% of patients who said D, refer for surgical mage procedure and ligation, but we're getting uh, more answers in. Now we're seeing a majority of people say add amiodarone to reduce the risk of stroke, but we actually have quite a, a number of answers A, B, and C, or excuse me, A, B, and D. So I think there's certainly uh, room for debate here. Uh, I, would, I would point out that the, one of the main uh, clinical features of this patient is presentation uh, with a stroke with significant uh, hemiplegia. And so I think that um, one could consider therapies for maintenance of sinus rhythm, uh, but the uh, important message of this, um, of, uh, of this case is that we don't have really good evidence that any therapy for atrial fibrillation other than anticoagulation reduces stroke risk. Mm -hmm. And that's the main message that I'd like to get across. So one might consider catheter ablation of AF in this patient to but not really to reduce the risk of future stroke because we don't really have hard evidence yet. Right. Now the Cabana trial certainly hopes to show that and it may indeed show that once the trial is completed. Uh, but currently we don't have strong evidence. In terms of answer B, the AFFIRM trial clearly shows that antiarrhythmic drug therapy does not reduce stroke risk. Right. So I think uh, answer B would not be correct. Um, my approach would first be to consider amiodarone or to add amiodarone for control of AF symptoms because here we're trying to control mm -hmm. the patient's symptoms. Anticoagulation therapy is really the main approach to try to reduce their future stroke risk. Now I think one could consider a surgical maze procedure and left atrial mm -hmm. appendage ligation uh, procedure in this patient, uh, but I think most, uh, most would recommend trying antiarrhythmic drug therapy and anticoagulation therapy as a first, first approach time. for this particular yeah. patient. Great, great cases. Um, I think that about does it for this, um, for this uh, series on atrial fibrillation. I think it was wonderful. We've covered uh, AFib incidents down to ablation strategies and certainly have new things on the horizon. Uh, I want to thank everyone for joining us at uh, Cardio Care Live and thank you Dr. Marine for joining us for this great session and of course I'd like to thank uh, Beringer Ingelheim Pharmaceuticals for their support of this important educational series. Please remember to complete the quiz at the end of the session to secure your CME credits and stay tuned for what is the real risk for bleeding with anticoagulation? That'll be with Dr. Christian Ruff and Jessica Mega. My name is Dr. Blaha. Thank you from Baltimore for joining us here today at Cardio Care Live.